welcome everybody um, to um, virtual Sunday morning at the virtual Marxist library. Um, and uh, it's good to see everybody here today from all over the world, or at least uh, the United States, I think. And um, our topic today is going to be a group discussion uh, on the Communist Manifesto with the stress on the group discussion. And um, to say again, uh, most of you, I think, know me. My name is uh, Eugene Rule. Um, uh, I uh, am uh, close to being one of the founding members of the ICSS, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society. And I need to know how I'm not doing real good in terms of managing my uh, electronic gear today, but um, let, let's see. Uh, okay, well, I'm a member of ICSS. I have a background in academia, emeritus professor of anthropology and Marxism, and currently at the Crit Critical Study of Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library. Um, and I know there's a lot of uh, excellent uh, t people have written about the Communist Manifesto, but that's not our task today. It's not the way I conceive this. I think what we need to do is I want to hear from other people what they think about the uh, Communist Manifesto and try to understand that in contemporary terms. Because as you all know, um, well, let's see. This is the Red Lion Hotel um, on Great Windmill Street in London. And this is where the original meeting of the, Commun of the Communist League, or the League of the Just, met there um, in December uh, 1847. Uh, they met in a small room upstairs. And there were a small number of people there. Um, Wilhelm Whiteling was one of them, a um, well-known uh, person in left circles. Marx himself was there, Engels, and a number of other people whose names I can't remember, but uh, Edgar um, von Westphalen, who is Marx's brothers-in-law, Joseph Wiedemeyer, and others. What's interesting is these um, were all uh, basically white men. They were in, uh, they were all European men, at least, the women there. Uh, and Marx himself uh, is interesting. I don't know, the Monthly Review, uh, almost many decades ago, wrote an article, was Marx a Negro, or something to that effect. And they said <laughs> he had very dark skin, uh, and uh, was they called him the Moor, and being Jewish, he quite likely did have ancestors, ancestors from, uh, from Africa. And uh, as the saying goes, if, if you were walking walk to the streets of uh, Charlottesville or Al streets in Alabama, they would not call him Dr. Marx, probably. They would probably use some other term. So at any rate, it's just good to know, know that. But what is interesting for me is that uh, a very small group of people, less than, half, less than a dozen people, founded this, um, this tremendous movement. And one of my professors at Columbia once said that something to the effect that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I'm sure she was talking about the group of about, again, less than a dozen men that um, got together and wrote the Communist Manifesto, which has been such a influential document in the world. And here, uh, uh, let me just, uh, yeah, th th there's um, uh, the specter of frightful hobgoblin talks about Europe. Uh, this is from the uh, early translation of the Communist Manifesto. 
that this is a picture of this hobgoblin. And let me get two other books here that I, I'm basing most of my stuff. Everything we have, it will be from the Marx Engels Internet Library, uh, which is online. And I will be simply showing a screenshot of that as we work our way through the manifesto. But there's two other interesting documents. One is, I don't know if people can see it. Yeah, it's um, Adventures of the Communist Manifesto by Hal Draper. And it's a very good, interesting book, a lot of inf good information. What it does, it has four versions of the manifesto. Um, in the original German, on one, on one of the columns is the original German. Uh, next to it is another column that has um, first English translation by Helen McFarlane, who is a member of the Chartists. Um, and she's the one that uh, begins by saying a frightful hobgoblin is, uh, is talking Europe. And uh, of course, we all know that, that the authorized English edition, which is by Engels, translated by Engels, uh, quite a while later, um, maybe a decade later, um, it says a specter is haunting Europe. And that's the way we all know about it. But all the powers of Europe and he, uh, are um, attempting to exorcise this demon. And here's the demon um, uh, that is stalking Europe. And uh, um, like that. But that's, you know, the way the manifesto has been perceived by so many is that it is the specter that is haunting Europe. And I think uh, someone said it's, uh, that communism is like the, the, the shadow of Marx, uh, the, of Marxism, that you can never get rid of it um, and it, as much as they try. So moving on here is, uh, but uh, communism, uh, the Communist Manifesto pre prevailed. Here's the victorious um, Russian troops that put an end to the worst invasion in human history. Um, and it led to the defeat of fascism, which is of uh, crucial importance. And this is not only in this, the formation of the Soviet Union, but also in China, people are uh, you know, loving uh, the Communist Manifesto. So it's one of their so influential there and here in Shanghai. Here's what communism has uh, accomplished in the world. Um, and also I didn't want to forget our Cuban friends, socialism and man in Cuba with Fidel and uh, Shea. So uh, communism has been so influential in the world. And I think that's important we bear that in mind when we read through the manifesto and see how we want to interpret it ourselves. But the most important thing I think is Communism has done uh, the ideas of the manifesto, what they have done for children and the youth of the world. And here is the um, picture of Soviet children. Again, they are not locked up in the sweatshops uh, as they were in the industrial revolution in England and America, but they are free. They are enjoying themselves uh, doing what they like to do, namely the ice cream. So, um, that's some of the background that I think we need to uh, bear in mind as we go through the manifesto. And what I would like to do is uh, not give you a analysis of what the common manifesto really is and how we should think about it, because there are a variety of people who have done that already. And if you want to, you can read those. But instead, I want to, uh, want to just work through the manifesto one paragraph at a time, read it and see what we think about it. See how we interpret it at the present time. And for the first uh, 10 minutes or so, which we're all already past, that's a wrong time frame. When I put this together, I was thinking we started at 10 and 20, but anyway, um, 
bear in mind with what I think, what I mean rather than what I'm saying here. But we'll start with about a half hour uh, talking about the first section, bourgeois and proletarians, and then we'll shift. We'll discuss that it's not me meant to be a presentation by me, but a reading of a, one paragraph, and then we'll talk about that. Um, so the first half hour, we could talk about bourgeois and proletarians, the first section. Uh, the second half hour, proletarians and communists, uh, the second section. Uh, third half hour, talk about socialists. Uh, actually, 15 minutes for that, um, since that's um, probably uh, difficult to interpret all that in terms of uh, the contemporary socialist movement. And finally, the last half hour, talk about um, the position of the communists in relation to existing oppositional parties. Um, and I've selected certain paragraphs I think are important or that I like personally. Because um, when we did the, used to do this at the library, we devoted, we didn't get through it in one day. Uh, we had to devote two or three sessions to work on our way through the manifesto paragraph by paragraph. But I don't think we want to do that uh, here. So I, I've selected some and I've asked people um, if they have particular passages they think we should uh, um, deal with to um, raise them as we go through. So um, let me pause there and see if there's any comments, questions, or disagreements, or whatever about how to proceed. Okay. Let me switch screens here, see if I can do that. Okay. Okay, let's just start here with bourgeois and proletarians. And can people see that okay? It's kind of my screen. Gene, I can see it. You can see it? Yeah. All right, well, let me go to bourgeois and proletarians then. Okay, it starts off with saying, the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. And um, a note from Engels says, by bourgeoisie is meant the class of modern capitalists, owners of the means of social production and employers of wage labor. By proletariat, the class of modern wage laborers. Excuse me, Gene. Yes. I, I, if you've got something else other than the uh, the outline that you start off with, I can't see it. I, are you reading from something? Do you have something else up there? Yes. Well, this is the manifesto, and I've clicked, and it's online at. Um, the Marcus Internet website. Which... Okay, I'm not. I'm not seeing it. Uh, I don't know if other people are. I'm... Yeah, I don't see it. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I think you're you're seeing what Gene is showing. Yeah, he, he may have to share a different screen or. Okay, I'm back to. Or he he may need to. Change the manifesto itself, not Engels. Yeah, I mean, I've got I've got a copy of it here, so I'm not. Okay, hopefully, um, even I can't see it too well. But let me see. Enter full screen. Maybe if you shrink your PowerPoint uh, uh, screen. Uh, let me work on that. No, I don't see it there either. Yeah. What do people see? Uh, I see a, a blue line and a, a, a bunch of writing in, in, in three paragraphs. Yeah, it's a, it's the last slide in your PowerPoint presentation, I think. Oh, no, I guess it's number 13, 164. Interesting. Uh, 
Um, okay, this is the PowerPoint. Uh huh. Okay, and you can see if you there's a link there to right. Arch Internet Archive, and yep. that, that link is what I'm reading from. And then there are two other sources that I think are very useful. One is um, uh, the Communist Manifesto, a roadmap to history. Um, and I like that because uh, even though it's by a Trotskyist, edited by a Trotskyist, he has a complete side by side notes that explain every term, uh, 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 which is, is useful. And it also includes a study guide. And second is the Adventures of the Communist Manifesto, which I mentioned before by Hal Draper. It also has a study guide in it, I think. Or no, there's another study guide online. Do but you mean this is Gary? I still only have the first page with the Marx Engels archives, the Communist Manifesto, and the. Okay. Yeah. Now, that's I, have the, I have the other one, the proposed schedule. If there's something mm -hmm. else you need to put, you need to put it on. Okay. Well, right now we should be on the manifesto itself. Really? Uh, We're history. not. <laughs> Say again. It, we we are. It looks like you've got. Uh, Gene, you have to go to that screen and yeah. highlight that screen. You have to get out of this screen. Yeah. 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 And it then may, it may your, be, Yeah. It you have to highlight that screen, and then you will have it. Right. I just put up a link to a, a presentation of the manifesto. If anybody feels like they want to get okay, it, okay, okay. Now we have there it. it uh, we have it. And I wonder what your attitude is about having everybody on mute. Uh, of course, I've taken myself off mute, but I don't know. Uh, I, perhaps everybody could do that, or don't you want anybody to do that, or all that? I would prefer people ex utilize a little self-discipline. Yeah, me too. Feel that it's important. You too. Mm -hmm. because, say, speaking right now, uh, we, we did, the reason we're doing this this week is because we had absolutely nothing else scheduled. And so I volunteered to do it uh, foolishly, as it turns out, but... Uh, Hopefully we'll get this worked out a little bit better. So, um, so that's the approach here. And basically it's not about me giving a lecture, but it's about we as a group um, uh, talking about what we think about this. And to start with, uh, we're starting with the first paragraph there. The history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. And um, um, there are two things that Engels put in the notes. One of them is the definition of bourgeois and proletarians, which I think we can talk about a little bit. I don't know if anybody has anything to say about these two terms and the two classes. And are these still relevant uh, in, in the modern world? Some people say, well, the, uh, class is no longer so important. And uh, besides which class structure is so diversified, we now no longer have bourgeois and proletariats. We have uh, the 1% and the precariat or so. So what do people have to say about this? I'll pause there. And uh, Norma, you look like you want to say something. Oh, no. I still can't I said what I had to say. OK, uh, Gary, do you have something? A comment? Uh, not much. I, I, I think that the um, I think that the definitions of bourgeois and proletariat pretty much stand in 2021 as they did in 1848. And I think that I think that a lot of the argumentation. I think that a lot of the um, I think that a lot of the argumentation and all these new buzzwords and stuff are varying ways of trying to weasel our way out of, out of what, what, what we're trying to get at. I, I tend to agree with you, but uh, there are other people who feel that, well, it is so much diversified, both in terms of here in the United States, um, uh, but also 
globally. Um, they should put forth their arguments. Well, I think I'm, I'm all ears. Does somebody have a contrary argument or a different point of view? Uh, no, I agree with Gary. Uh, I, I agree with Gary, but of course, uh, the nature of the uh, means of production, the industry uh, evolved. So, uh, uh, so what's the uh, what's included in the? Uh, noise. It, it includes more uh, than just the factory worker. Uh, that was in the 19th century, but uh, basically uh, it, it holds, but one has to also uh, take into account that um, uh, the industry technology has changed, so, uh, so naturally what... <coughs> well, what is that noise? ...themselves, if they're not talking, Feedback. Uh, that would get rid of some of that, I think. Somebody has two things on. Uh, that feeds back. Yeah. Could I just interrupt, Raj? There is at least one person in the waiting room who's been there a while. Okay. So, so, okay, I'll admit. Sorry. Thank you. If people will identify themselves uh, before coming on, that would be helpful. If you're George from Nebraska. One thing that I got out of when I went back over this was I had forgotten that he had defined the whole this whole dialectic, the whole historical struggle in terms of history. And that for him the class struggle was really within the con the con, within a within a historic perspective. Uh, so in some sense I think I would I might disagree a little bit with Gary in that uh, we I think we've we may have transcended, we may have gotten beyond uh, the straight, you know, uh, industrial bourgeoisie uh, struggle, and gotten more into uh, the financial struggle. Other comments? I, I, I you know, I, I think, you know, I think it depends on who's, who's bringing up the term. Uh, the, the, the Soviets back in 77 and 78 were talking about the proletariat in Afghanistan. You got to be kidding. They're tribes people. Yeah. What, what proletariat? What the, 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 the people picking the poppies? I mean, uh, the, of course, they were looking to take control of Afghanistan, whether to whether to put in a communist government or not. It didn't make any difference. So the term proletarian is being really usurped here by Moscow at this point. Well, we're not in Moscow, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Which didn't quite work out for him either. <laughs> we know that. OK, let me just shift for a minute. Uh, to the second note that uh, Engels made, um, because on the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. And uh, on the note two there says, Engels says, that is all written history. And he mentions that before, uh, you know, before you had written, written history, you had prehistory, and during that period, these were class societies. And Engels talks about, talks about in this in much greater detail in um, Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State, um, which needs to. How, how would you know that they were classless prehistory if, they, if it was written down? Um, the, the reason. Well, Engels drew upon the work of um, Lewis Henry Morgan, who was an American anthropologist, who gathered his data from uh, travelers' accounts and actual work with a prehistoric society, not a prehistoric society, but a contemporary society, the Iroquois, whom he analyzed in great detail. And part of what he said there, there was no state um, that... that uh, you didn't all the everything you see in existing America, you know, prisons, police, armies, and so forth. None of that existed among the Iroquois 
or among Indians generally, but everything went its natural way because people cooperated. And this has been called a communist society correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, many people call it primeval co communism or primitive communism. I like to see it as uh, ancestral communism because uh, these people were our ancestors. We all, you know, uh, bourgeois society is quite willing to admit that our ancestors were apes, uh, but they have a lot of trouble admitting that our ancestors were also communists and that their grandchildren will be grand communists as well. So um, I think that's a more appropriate term. But at any rate, um, th there's abundant uh, information from existing societies that live by hunting and gathering, or at least did exist in Ingalls and Morgan's day. People living by uh, hunting and gathering. There's the uh, Bushman, the Dobie Kong in, in South Africa, this extended uh, people there. And, and clearly this was a classless society. So uh, I think Ingalls is absolutely correct here on saying that you know, this refers to existing society, and by that, you mean state level, quote, self styled civilized societies. So, Gene, Mark uh, Albertson has raised his hand. Okay, uh, go ahead, Mark. Gene, it also says in the Communist Manifesto the struggle between the haves and have nots. Now, we've had that throughout much of man's existence no matter what kind of society, the haves and have nots, whether it's a landed society or it's a capitalistic style of society, modern capitalistic style of society. Isn't that going on in this country right now? Absolutely. But it's not going on. Historically, people, anthropologists who have lived with uh, societies that, li that live by hunting and gathering, um, uh, there's, it's not divided into haves and have-nots, that, uh, that there's an obligation. And, and Morgan talks about this, that the, the law of hospitality, meaning that anybody that comes into the village has to be fed. Uh, and if you have food, you have to share it with it. Um, and uh, this anthropologist talks about when he was working in South Africa with Adobe Kung, he took all his food with him because he didn't want to live off the existing society and they were eating, you know, grasshoppers and as well as meat, you know, and so on. But uh, that would have disrupted. But so he'd eat, eat by himself and in, in, in open up a can of, uh, of chili or whatever and eat by himself. And they just thought, God, this guy is, you know, basically subhuman. If you have <laughs> uh, and it's like if you were doing field work in, in you know in a city in, in 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 America, and you sat down on your front step every morning, and masturbated, you'd be thought a little bit odd, uh, to put it mildly. So again, this hoarding food is just totally against the ethic of existing honey. There are no very few, if any, uh, societies that continue to live by solely my hunting and gathering, but there were in the very recent past. And this was not divided into haves and have nots. So well, I'd like to say, say something if I may. Um, yes, please. You have, of course, haves and have nots, but have what and have, uh, have not what, that's I think a question to consider. One possibility is to look at the ownership of means of production as the primary distinguishing point. And of course, another is to say owners of wealth, we, even if they are not owning uh, means of production, maybe they are owning uh, wealth, which could be used eventually to result in production. So that could be how one could distinguish. And then comes the interesting issue that what happens if there are some people who own some shares or some means of production indirectly or directly and are also working at the same time. So now when we simply say proletariat and bourgeoisie or oppressed and oppressed, oppressors or haves or have nots, so there are uh, these in between people, of course, we can say they are in neither here nor there, or we can just say that uh, they possess some means of production, therefore they belong to the 
bourgeoisie? Well, in, in bourgeois society, in Euro-American and Japanese society, I would say there's a there's another category of folks that need to be taken in to account, especially especially over the last two to three years. And that is a category known as the has-beens. And also the never was. <laughs> um, let me also just say, you know, there's some of us like myself that had a tenured job um, and now have a fairly decent re retirement so that, uh, you know, I have all the food I want and basically I can take care of, you know, if I want something, I buy it. But that's not characteristic of the overwhelming majority of our species. Um, whereas we know that, uh, you know, there are actually people who around the world who haven't been vaccinated yet and can't get act vaccinated. So we can see the dramatic change in the condition of people around the world. So, um, so in, in the modern capitalist nations, for various reasons, including past imperialism and other things, so there are there's a large class of people, a large numbers of people who do possess some wealth and some means of production, so that they are not exactly at the point where they have nothing to lose. Therefore, they might be tending to oppose revolutionary forces or Marxist forces, and that is the the, the problem that we have to. I think do consider because especially in this country, I was quite surprised that in that Walmart uh, union struggle, I was surprised that the workers eventually a majority of them voted against unionization. I think you mean um, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so these things seem to happen all the time. Even today, uh, I'm constantly amazed at how in uh, so many states uh, people are openly opting for policies which are opposing their own interests in the long run. So it's, uh, uh, the fact that some individuals possess some property, some wealth, seems to predispose them uh, in, in favor of quote unquote order and uh, against any uh, potential uh, revolutions or uh, movements against the bourgeoisie. Um, they may not possess wealth, but if you've ever been in a startup company, they give you stocks, but those stocks aren't worth anything usually um, or very much. But people, um, this is Nina, by the way, um, you know, they're made to think that they have some a little stake in the in the company by giving them uh, shares. And then you have to realize that that during the uh, pandemic, the, the market did very well. You know, uh, relatively speaking, people did very well in the market. So they're sort of looking at it. And the other part of the Amazon struggle is that that uh, Jeff Bezos and and his you know the owner the owners of uh, of Amazon um, well they they were uh, breaking all union uh, rules like having time where they they captured the workers and made them sit and listen to anti union propaganda you know <clears throat> was intense you know which is against uh, the NLRB et cetera. so okay maybe we should move on cuz i don't think we're going to resolve this and this will continue to come up but let's read the next passage here that starts with freedmen and slave. That's the second paragraph. And uh, I'd rather somebody else read that. Um, do we have a volunteer? Or let me rephrase that. Raj, do we have a volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want me to read it, uh, Gene, or you want I somebody else to read it? Several paragraphs. Okay. Now, to our epic has... has uh, do you want me to read? Yeah, if you'd read, please. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, to there, right? Free men yeah. and slave, yes. Free, free men and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppress, oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended 
either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. In the earlier epoch of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gra gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs. In almost all of these classes, again, subordinate gradations. The modern bourgeois society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms. It has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. Our epoch, the epoch of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, this distinct feature. It has simplified class antagonism, uh, antagonisms. Uh, society as a whole is more and more uh, splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. Okay, well, we, okay. let's pause there and uh, if anybody has anything to say on that, I do certainly because I think, again, this is one of the, one of the things about the manifesto is it does sum up, you know, uh, the existing class struggle in, in a very brief and insightful way. So I think this, this is very, very important and uh, how do other people think about this? It's, 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 I think that last paragraph, uh, especially the whole thing around directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat, is to say the least a stretch. Because? Because there's more, because there's more than those two, two major classes. There's all, kinds of, there's all kinds of folks in between. Uh, yeah. May I make a comment, Gene? On, on both yours and Gary's. Well, I one thing I want to observe here is somebody else had said uh, that uh, in pre-capitalist society, we didn't have classes. And that's not what Marx and Engels are saying here. Classes existed. And, uh, and also notice they're talking about oppressors and oppressed as two different classes. And the oppressor and oppressed have almost always existed in some form or another, although in exceptional cases like the uh, examples Gene was giving in the US uh, prior to the immigrants who came and ruined it everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe it didn't ruin, but change it and made it pretty bad. Uh, so that I want everybody to notice that it isn't just the modern uh, production system of capitalism that have classes. They're talking about oppressed and oppressors are, are, are two classes opposed to each other. The other thing I want to say to Gary's comment that the class, he noticed that they, he uses, they qualify the classes as great classes. Now there is a middle class in the middle and that is not a great class. So that's the only comment I have on Gary's comment. So there are two great classes. One is the uh, ownership of means of production, the capitalist class. The other is the working class. In between, uh, there are other classes, but they are not great classes. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Do we want to put together a stack here? Uh, does anybody else? How many people have something to say on that? Uh, Maybe we should ask uh, Sharon to do this uh, if she's willing. Sharon, could you please do this? Uh, I I have a broken wrist, so I can't write. So oh, okay. It usually uh, takes being able to write thing, write names down. Could someone else please do it this time? Okay, so I I nominate Judy Ann. How about Judy Ann? Would you be the moderator, please, Judy Ann? I have absolutely no idea how we do this. 
do I go, go to participants and then watch for hands being raised or yes is that the trick yeah okay I'll try to do that okay or, the, or in the chat too yeah uh, actually, there is a reactions button. I guess that's not available to everybody. Reactions button says uh, hand raise. Okay. Well, let my. Does anyone want to speak right now? How many people? Yeah. Daniel well, has a hand raised. The only one I see with a hand raised is Daniel. Yes, I wanted to say something. I just posted uh, in the. Um, chat uh, a, a line that was read was, is in almost all of these classes again subordinate gradations which I think was kind of glossed over by us trying to make clearer what the class arrangement is and I want to I think it needs to be emphasized or accepted or commonly that the prehistory was populated, you know, a long time ago, populated by classless society. That's all. No, I don't know about that. Somebody else. So if I may speak, one of the things I'd like to note here is that even here the word is splitting up. So it's a they see the world as constantly changing and at a given point they're seeing it in a particular way and when this was written it was changing in a particular direction and since then other changes have also occurred and one of the perhaps the characterizing feature of today's uh, that uh, the number of people who have absolutely no interest in maintaining the current state that has been artificially shrunk by creating this in between classes, which are uh, now, I think they're also fairly major because uh, there are a large number of individuals who have uh, an interest in the continuation of the current society who are in between those who are completely dispossessed and those who own the means of production. In other words, they have a little bit of a stake and by giving them that little bit of a stake, they have become a, uh, a force which is opposing any uh, movement, any progressive uh, movements by, of the proletariat themselves. And uh, among other things, they are uh, playing a role which is often uh, quite conservative as well. And that's because their economic interests are not purely aligned with the proletariat, nor are they purely aligned with the bourgeoisie, but uh, they are owning some shares in the means of production. Okay, Daniel and then Mark. Sure. Okay, so um, <clears throat> first of all, generally in hunter-gatherer or uh, forager societies, we don't generally see classes. Um, there are dwindling dwindling number of these societies left, but they still definitely exist and can be observed. Um, um, at one point, um, before the agricultural revolution, um, basically all of humanity was forager societies um, and classless society. Um, secondly, uh, as I put in chat, um, what in the USA politicians refer to as the middle class is actually a conflation of the petty bourgeoisie, which would be your small business owners, shop you know, owners, uh, that sort of thing, and your labor aristocracy, the portion of the working class whose labor is valuable enough um, and specialized enough to um, secure a much higher standard of living than your general laborers. So people like doctors, I would put um, also um, to some extent, uh, union um, job, you know, highly paid union jobs in the USA for what few there are still um, in this category. Uh, politicians like to conflate these to pretend that there's a such thing as a middle class um 
and define class by standard of living rather than relations to production, but it's actually a conflation of essentially the bottom of the bourgeoisie with the top of the working class, um, at least as far as I can observe. Um, while the um, while the doctor or um, longshore worker, as they actually make a pretty good wage, or or garbage collector may all have similar incomes to the uh, restaurant owner or what have you. Uh, they actually have very different um, relationships to the means of production, which is how classes are defined in a Marxist context. Uh, the, the petty bourgeoisie, the uh, small business owner, uh, makes money by owning capital, essentially, while the, while even a doctor, um, unless they're in private practice, I suppose, um, is still essentially selling their labor rather than owning capital. Um, when they give workers, you know, shares of the company or whatever, it's just to further obfuscate this, uh, and and blur this this class distinction, at least in my observation. Right. Okay. Very so, good. So, Mark, Richard, Richard W., and Yusef, yeah. go next. Yeah, there 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 is you know this this idea of of, of registering classes. Uh, you know, when you go back to the revolutionary period here, uh, in the in the in the Federalist. Alexander Hamilton noted that all societies basically divide themselves into two classes. First are the rich and the well-born, and then the mass. Uh, the mass is too tempestuous and unpredictable to rule, so leave, therefore, uh, a permanent stake in rule with the first class. They will forever steady the second class. Now, that's coming out of the Federalist uh, here. Uh, that's, that's kind of a basic look at society, it's not really a microscopic style of style of uh, not not a, a really a microscopic look. Uh, uh, I want to point out to uh, Judy to Julian that Mohan's hand has been up for a while. Uh, yeah, he spoke first before the person who had. Their yeah, hand. I did. Speak. Thank you. And I okay. have him on the list for again. Okay, his hand was up, so that's why. And please put yes. Gene on the stack. Gene, okay, got you. So let me tell you what's on the stack now. Richard W., Yusuf, uh, the phone, I think is Rich. No, Mohan, then the phone, which is Rich and Gene. So go ahead, Richard. Um, so it's, it strikes me that um, the first time, this, this was written back at pretty much the dawn of the industrial era. Uh, I mean, uh, Engels had just written his his book on the industrial, the uh, what was the working class in living, uh, living, uh, poor. Oh, God, I can't think. Of, my mind's going. Um, and and that was a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, I think you know. So we have to look at this in the in within the constraints of of a, a historic document, in which in which case the, the, this was like these two great classes were in fact forming. And you know, from the from the text, it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't leave out other classes. For example, at that time, I think there were still elements of feudalism going on. Uh, you know, there was certainly uh, uh, mercantilists going on. Uh, I think the Hanseatic League was still uh, active in in, uh, uh, in the European continent. Uh, so it's not like this. It was not like this thing was just a a, a sudden transformation. It's oh well. A sudden uh, split. It, it really was a gradual transformation, um, and and so that's so so that's how you, I think you have to read this, um, and that's why I also think that that the, uh, that maybe this whole bourgeois proletariat uh, has changed in in the later in the later um, you know like in the twentieth century, twenty first century now. Uh, thanks. Okay. 
Yusuf. Yusuf, are you ready? Yusuf, do you want to speak? Your hand is up. Probably speaking, but he's muted. Yeah, Yusuf, turn off, uh, turn on your microphone. Unmute yourself. But we'll go back to him. Mohan, you put your hands down. Do you want to speak now? If so, unmute yourself and go ahead. He doesn't know how to unmute. Is there a way for us to do that? I have already spoken. Okay. So, just go ahead. Okay. Yusuf, you're not ready? Uh, yes. Um, you well, are. If Yusuf, okay. And then Rich, Johnson, and Jean. Uh, yes. Well, well, this was, uh, uh, as uh, previous said, this was um, uh, before the age of imperialism. So uh, things have, uh, have changed, particularly in the imperial countries. Uh, so I think we should, uh, one has to take into consideration that. Mm. Okay, Rich. Rich, can you unmute yourself? On the Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to speak to the question of a few moments ago where they were talking about uh, the crossover between the proletariat and the uh, lower, whatever, the uh, in the bourgeoisie. And, uh, <clears throat> and the specific uh, reference was to doctors that are being paid a, a wage or salary or whatever, pretty high up there, but still they could be at that moment uh, considered part of the proletariat uh, because they're being paid a salary or whatever, and they uh, don't own the means of production. They definitely don't own the hospital generally. Uh, one of them might, or a small group of them might be part of the ownership. Anyway, I once worked in a hospital in 19, I'm trying to remember when it was, I think it was 70, uh, roughly early, very early 70s, I think. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I was in LVN and I worked in uh, recovery, which means the men's room, the changing room, where we changed from our street clothes to our greens, uh, and we would be we would be accepting uh, patients that had just come out of surgery for whatever reason. It's called recovery. That, in other words, you're gassed. You're under. You're not conscious or not fully conscious, and you can have trouble, all kinds of trouble, with the drugs from before. How you come down, breathing, all sorts of things. So you can die on the table after the operation. So I'm uh, I'm st I'm standing there in the dressing room you know, with my locker and I'm getting out of my, or I forget if I was dressing or undressing or getting ready to go to work or off work. Stop it. And uh, there's a doctor on the opposite, you know, he can't see me. He's on the other side of the lockers and where his lockers were, but it was like the same room. He's like 10 feet away from me or less. And he's on his uh, phone, his cell phone or whatever it was. I don't know if we had cell phones then. He was on a telephone and he was talking to his, uh, he was negotiating, or he was discussing his property about buying a huge apartment thing, uh, yeah, what, you know, where he would be the owner uh, because he had wealth. In other words, he could have been uh, making, he could have been making at that time 100000 a year, but he probably had a million or two just sitting there and he had to invest it or it would lose value. And so there, what I'm saying is, you can look, you have to have the whole picture when you're talking about individuals and groups of individuals like doctors who might appear uh, on some level uh, by some definition to be on the edge of the working class because they don't own property. But in fact, they could own property and you wouldn't know the difference. 
you would have no way to know unless you had access to data that showed you they had their feet in both pots and they were doing quite well. Um, and some of these guys, to be honest, personally, were total assholes. And uh, some of them were real people and tried their best and you can't, you know, just this is an individual thing. So that's my point and uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Gene, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and we have some excellent discussion here, and thank everybody. I just want to point two things. First of all, uh, this was written in 1847, uh, so we have to understand that, that, that that's when this was written. The second thing, thing I'd like to do is look at this from the perspective of my two favorite socialists, Bernie Sanders here in the United States and Xi Jinping in Beijing. <laughs> but um, from Bernie's perspective, this is all he talks about, basically. You know, the rich are getting richer and, and you know, it's the 1%. And he sees, you know, he does have a class analysis, which is very, uh, and does not depend on money from uh, the corporations. So um, here in the United States, we need to see that yes, indeed, in Bernie's perspective, we have divided into two great classes and it's the 1% versus the rest of us, the 99%. So, and that's useful. I mean, it's not Marxist analysis, uh, but it still is gotten into the consciousness of many people, um, particularly the younger people uh, this day, as, as Bernie says, you know, he's winning the battle uh, wait, uh, What's that? Uh, somebody's unmuted. Uh. That's one thing here in the United States. We need to understand the consciousness of these two classes is increasing. And <clears throat> looking at it from the perspective of the other class, uh, from, from the perspective of uh, Xi Jinping, and internationally, if you look at this, Yes, indeed, there are two great classes. Um, and if you go back the, the, the um, after the Russian Revolution and the constitution of the um, Union of Soviet Socialist Society, they say, you know, imperialism is dividing. The world is dividing into the imperialist camp and the camp of social, the socialist camp. And these are basically you know, the imperialist class represents the international bourgeoisie and the socialist camp represents basically the Soviet Union and now China. Uh, and basically you look at these two great classes that are confronting one another. And of course, uh, this could very easily lead any day now to nuclear war uh, between uh, these two classes as the existing ruling class, the uh, United States imperialists uh, are confronting uh, the increasingly well-organized proletariat. And I know many people disagree with this, but that's my position and I'm sticking to it. So um, we should probably put together, go through the existing class and maybe then jump forward to the next section of the manifesto if that's what people want. And nobody else has their hand up, so it sounds like thing you ought to do. So, oh, sorry, Raj put his hand up. Yeah, I just want to comment on Jean's last comment and also his slide which in the introduction where he shows Shanghai's high rises as communist building that. So my comment is, no, it is not built by the communists. It was built by the workers of China <laughs> and some of them were certainly built for the capitalists of China. So uh, uh, I know the Chinese Communist Party rules, so it's not the same as here, but uh, uh, the issue of uh, class society that exists today, it also is an issue in China. That's all I want to say. Okay, do we want to go forward? I think so. Okay, uh, so let's jump forward to chapter two, 
proletarians and communists. And um, does someone want to read Richard uh, Wright? You're a good reader. Could you read the next couple paragraphs? I have to unmute myself. What makes you think I'm a good reader, by the way? Because uh, I know you are. <laughs> and, I, I, and I second it. I think <laughs> You're just trying to get out of it, damn it. <laughs> Four or five paragraphs, I think. Uh, okay, stop me when you get tired. Okay. Uh, proletarians and communists. In what relation do the communists stand to the proletarians as a whole? The communists do not form a separate party opposed to other working class parties. They have no interest separate and apart from those of the proletariat as a whole. They do not set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape and mold the proletarian movement. The communists are distinguished from the other working class parties by this only. One, in the national struggle of the proletarians of the different countries, they point out and bring to the front the common interest of the entire proletariat independently of all nationality. Two, in the various stages of development which the struggle of the working class against the bourgeoisie has to pass through, they always and everywhere represent the interest of the movement as a whole. The communists, therefore, are on the other hand, practically the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties of every country. That section which pushes forward all others on the other hand, theoretically, they have over the great mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, eh, well, anyways, the conditions and the ultimate general results of the proletarian movement. Okay, is that a good place to stop? Do yeah. Say, I think Gary might have something to say about the line of march. Yeah. <laughs> Having been a member, were you not, Gary? We're talking about the organization Line of March. Go on, go on, Rick. Go on, Gene. Snitch me out. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, this may—I don't know to what extent this is, is properly considered to be a statement of the way things ought to be, uh, because we know that. Um, We have a lot of different communist parties here in the United States. And, uh, so do we, does anybody want to speak on behalf of any particular party or the general situation of the left? Well, but again, this has to be taken in the context of a historic document. At this point, I mean, the, rel the number of communist parties were one, two at most. I mean, Actually, there were no communist parties at that time. Okay. <laughs> there, there was the Communist League and other groups, but no, right. no one called themselves the Communist Party. But go ahead. Hence the reference to the specter haunting Europe. <laughs> no, Han, what do you want to say? I, I put something in the chat, and I believe that, as uh, Richard pointed out, this describes where they were at this time in history, that the communists had come together, and they were formulating their position, and at that point, they were supportive of various working parties, and so on. And again, this is a descriptive statement rather than saying that this is what communists ought to be. I don't think they are saying that. Actually, there were two statements. I think that Marx was talking about where the direction we want to head in. The other, the other document, which, which was a draft of what became the manifesto, was, was written by uh, Frederick Engels, and it was sort of like a catechism around the same time. Okay, let me say a few additional words in, in defense. Um, again, um, about the line of march, and I just lost my place here. Um, you know, the, 
from the perspective of my comrade, uh, Xi Jinping, um, you know, they have achieved a certain leadership in terms of the what's going on. Not only do they have the largest communist party in the world, um, with 92 million members who regularly are have have various institutes, Marxism throughout the country, as well as a um, you know, central central place in in in, in, in uh, uh, Moscow, in Beijing, where the Central Committee's um, school is located. And I believe one of our comrades, so um, I think Rover may have spoken there, uh, as well as um, Wadi. Um, so, you know, this they are putting this together, but they have the largest communist party, well-educated. They have the um, largest working class party in the world, you know, with the um, all China Federation of Labor Unions, of trade unions, which, you know, has over 300 million members organized into that. Um, and it's also made tremendous strides forward in terms of elimination of poverty and uh, has had some disputes with other countries around the world, but has all, almost in every account settled those without bloodshed, unlike the imperialists. So, you know, I, I think we need to understand the leadership. The other thing is, um, you know, they recently celebrated their 100th anniversary as a party, but they also, um, not so much in the news, but they had a gathering, an online gathering of, I think, 90, like 600 communist parties around the world uh, that represented like, uh, over a hundred different countries got together uh, in this gathering last week, I think, of communist and so of progressive. Earlier this week. Pardon? It was earlier this week. Right. And what what was the title of the of that gathering? Do you remember, Jerry? I forget, but it was six hundred parties, and and not and not nearly all of them were communists. Right. Um, did the CPUSA go there? Yes, they did. We were represented by three people. Outstanding. So I'm just saying that, that there is, um, um, you know, that I think in terms of understanding the line of march and the general results and what's going on, um, I, I think uh, um, we have to consider that very seriously. And uh, I'm sure Raj has a different view, but we'll probably talk about this more next week as well. So I put up a relevant a comment. I put up a relevant comment in the chat saying, "I've I've learned." Oh, there goes the phlegm one. Is that you, Gary? No. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, um, saying that the I'm I'm told that the billionaires don't run China, of course. The Communist Party runs China. Hmm. Okay. Are you finished, Norma? You can put your hand yeah. up. Okay. All right. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Sure. Right now, there's a phrase there called bourgeois property. Okay. Are they referring to the means of production or something else? Or the production by the bourgeoisie? Or property of that belongs to the bourgeoisie? Richard, W? Yeah. I, once again, I even though this is an historic document, I find it interesting that one of the things that they're pointing out is that um, is that they, they claim to have a, um, a, an advanced analysis of the, of the production system and of its outcome. And I think I, I contrast that to today in which um, Marxism has, has vanished as far from the left uh, to be replaced by, uh, by various uh, uh, identity politics uh, analysis. So, yeah. you, so that you have uh, 
you know, hey, Black Lives Matter, you know, who, uh, you know Black, um, uh, you have the environmental section, um, you have the gay, lesbian, and and whatever else. Uh, um, uh, me, me too. Uh, me, I, me, uh, me too. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, the point is, is that, is that, is that, um, is that they are claiming the that they have a uh, a better understanding of the of where things are going than uh, than than we do today. And um, uh, anyways, I, uh, I which I happen to agree with. I'll say. Huh. You will, Richard. There have been identity politics groupings all the way down the line since 1848 in one form or another. The communists are still here. Uh, okay. I, <laughs> are you giving me a thumbs up on that? or? A <laughs> yeah, what are you saying? <laughs> well, no, what I'm saying is, is that today we don't see much analysis of, uh, of class, uh, class analysis of, uh, it's it's vanished in terms of uh, of the police uh, ba banging on you know on blacks you know uh, you know just a yes I, I agree very much uh, it's turned into a giant if if I listen to NPR it's a giant identity politic thing one yeah. after the other it's it's uh, it's almost like brainwashing or something like there's no economic relationship or there's, you know, there's no Marxist or, or economic relationship between this at all. It's just one identity politics group against another, you know, versus another. It's absurd. Yep, Nina, we better hurry up and get ourselves a party. <laughs> <laughs> it's my party. And I'll cry if I want to. <laughs> yep. <laughs> This is Gene again. Um, if nobody has, if there's no stack, let me, uh, I'm trying to find some things I wanted to make sure we touched upon. And when talking about property, let me read a couple of passages here. Um, and I, I have it on the screen. Um, when we talk about um, property relationships, we talk about property. He says, um, the abolition of existing property relations is not at all a distinctive feature of communism. All property relations in the past have been continually subject to historical change and consequent upon the change in historical conditions. The French Revolution, for example, abolished feudal property in favor of bourgeois property. The distinctive feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. But the modern bourgeois property, private property, is the final and most complete expression of the system of producing and uh, appropriating product, products that is based on the class antagonisms on the exploitation of the many by the few. In this sense, the property of the communists, the theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. And so I think it's important to understand that this phrase is based upon, um, uh, uh, um, you know, this whole passage here. And when they talk about abolition of private property, they are talking about, um, you know, the, 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 the private property of the capitalists, uh, which is summed up most uh, um, clearly in the stock market, I think. So I'll pause there and if somebody has something to say. Yeah, I do. I do, Eugene. Yes, go. Joe Slovo put it beautifully, the late Joe Slovo of the South African Communist Party. We are not interested in confiscating your old colony style furniture or your stereos. We're, we're going we're going after the big guys. Well, that's true. <clears throat> um, 
But again, uh, I, I think that phrase is very, very important and uh, is worth uh, bearing in mind when we talk about property. Well, this is interesting, Gene, because I, I, I thought about this here a little. Uh, uh, you know, you have a nice retirement because you were in a, a particular generation that um, did a little better than the people who came after you. But, uh, and, and, but your retirement is in the stock market. You have to realize that the state, uh, you know, through PERS, is very much in the stock market. And since you believe very much in uh, revolution, uh, you have in the past quoted that it'll be a violent revolution. And, and you know, from that, I, I, I uh, you know, deduce that it's uh, uh, that the stock market will be uh, taken apart and taken down and and you'll lose your retirement. So, you know, um, <laughs> I don't I like to get a little bit personal here about how how, you know, the, the property thing will come down. Uh, they're coming after the little guys. Well, if they come after the stock market, there's a lot of people uh, who are uh, state workers who like you who have PERS uh, and that PERS is in the stock market. And, and there were times when the stock market took a hit and, and, and they had to make up the difference. But they won't be able to if, they, if, they, if you take away the stock market. Market. So are you willing to do that, G? There's no worry about it happening right away. No, rather than, than right away, I'm just saying, uh, he, since he's in, in favor of violent revolution, I'm just trying no, to get... You, you're conflating thinking. <laughs> but let Gene answer the question. Let Gene. Yeah. I'm not interested in anyone else. Sir. I just oh, oh, well, then we have a private conversation going on? No, we don't, Norma. I it's specifically because Gene has talked about. You know, I heard. I heard what you said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that about the violent revolution, and then that's going to affect the stock market. Norma, let Gene speak. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me do first of all say that the, the manifesto. Uh, if they were to confiscate all this and move directly tomorrow into a system of socialism, I would be very happy. Just like I would be quite willing to give up my little Prius if they abolished auto, all private automobiles. Uh, but they haven't done that. Uh, so again, we have to wait until this happens and I would mu much greater, happier see, to see that done. Now, the other thing is in terms of, um, uh, that, that it must be violent. Unfortunately, um, the, the, as we used to say in one of my little study groups, it says the best way to make sure that the revolution remains nonviolent is that everybody knows we will win a violent revolution. And um, I think that's another important point. And uh, the other thing I want to stress is that I've time and time again said we need to look at America's uh, greatest spiritual and political figure, uh, Dr. King, uh, who, who, talk, who said that, you know, we need to confront the world's greatest uh, purveyor of violence in the world, namely our own government. And he called for a radical revolution of values. Uh, and again, he was the apostle, basically, of a nonviolent revolution, of a, um, you know, exerted by force of will. So just to, I, I'd rather not be misquoted uh, or put in a, a context that is not one of my own making. And I'll stop there. Anyone else want to step in? Nobody else should step in. Yes. No hands on the stack. Nope. This is Gary. Go ahead. Gene. Uh, Gary. Concerning Dr. King, go to the library at some point and check out his collected works put out by Stanford University. Uh, and start with and start with his undergraduate years in the 1940s. He does not like capitalism at all. We need to do away from this mythology, with this mythology about how he started out as a moderate or conservative at some church in Montgomery, Alabama, and by 1968 he was a raving, he was a raving radical, ready to overthrow the government. We need to get, we need to get out of that. Start with 1944, Volume One of Dr. King. 
Does that mean that we should look at what Biden said as being antithetical to, <laughs> to capitalism? All those rules and laws that you signed on to? I haven't read Biden. I've read Dr. King. Yeah, uh, it's okay, Gary. There's other people on this program um, that just, and some of them, I imagine, have read the news of yesterday, the, the signings that Biden did and the comments that he sent along with it as in that if capitalism is supposed to be capitalism, then we have to stop having limits on competition, like uh, non-disclosure agreements and so forth. It's very funny. Ish. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think that the most important point that Jean made was that in order to assure that any real change is not going to be violent, is you have to prove to those who have the power now that they're going to lose that violent revolution. So they had better make the changes. Otherwise, it will have to be violent. They're not going to just sit by and watch and let themselves lose what they feel they have the right to. So it's already violent. They're already killing us out there. They're starving us out there. They're torturing us out there. It's already violent. It's just <laughs> we're taught not to notice. Yeah, but we but but what we are taught, or how someone else was calling it brainwashing, uh, is that these are just little separate little parts of it, and we're going to fix those things and make it pretty and nice. And what Marx is saying, and I suppose we all basically believe, is you can't fix it and make it nice because ultimately, it is what is essentially the 1% against the 99%. Only the 99% are really not very clear about what that is because they want to be part of the 1% since they're so brainwashed. This is why I like Leonard Cohen's uh, song. Mm -hmm. First we take Manhattan and then we take Berlin. <laughs> and then we'll take what? Berlin. Berlin. Oh, I think, yeah, I, he, of course, he's talking about uh, identity politics there, but okay. I can say as a Jewish person, I can I know what he means there. So. Let me let me just uh, quote the manifesto again here. And I have it up on the screen where it says, you are horrified at our intending to do away with private property. But in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. <laughs> its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of nine-tenths. You approach us, therefore, with intending to do away with the form of property, the necessary condition for whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. In one word, you reproach us for, with intending to do away with your property. Precisely so. That is just what we intend. <laughs> I like hey. it. The, the, the thing about the manifesto is it's, it's people should really memorize it. They uh, <laughs> should read it for the first time every year. Uh, <laughs> every time you read it, you come across it with all these things that are speaking directly to us right now. Um, and I think um, uh, um, that, that needs to be, be understood. It has been objected that upon the abolition of private property, all work will cease and universal laziness will overtake us. According to this, bourgeois society ought long ago to have gone to the dogs through sheer idleness. For those of its members who work acquire nothing. And those who acquire anything do not work. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know, it, it's, it really would have been worthwhile just to go through a paragraph by paragraph, but if we had done so, we'd still be back in chapter one.
Right. But you could use an example, Jeff Bezos. I mean, I think every minute he makes uh, about, I can't remember, I, I was looking at this thing, you know, like a couple thousand dollars every minute or million. 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 <laughs> <laughs> what 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 does he do? <laughs> anyway, I wrote something that somebody's throwing money off into space from those space visits they're the idiots are doing now. Yeah, but Bezos said it. Bezos had enough sense not to be on that ship. <laughs> right, we'd be shooting at it. Uh huh. He gets to he gets to stick around and run Jeff Bezos' grocery outlet. <laughs> he can sell. Well, anyway. <laughs> Read some more, somebody. Yeah, let's go forward. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find something I wanted to to. Okay, here we go to to the the ten. Uh, the original 10 point program program saying that um, in the beginning this you know, <laughs> let me, let me lovely down in here. the beginning the measure the measures will of course be different in different societies nevertheless in most advanced countries the following will be pretty generally applicable. One, abolition of property in land and the application of all rents. Jean, just a minute. Everybody needs to mute themselves so that Jean's not getting interference, please. Yeah, inter interference. Abolition of property in land and the application of all rents of land to public purposes. Two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. Four, confiscation of the property of all immigrants and immigrants. And centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Six, Centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. Seven, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state. The bringing of wastelands and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan. Equal, eight, equal liability of all to work establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Nine, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of all the distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of the populace over the country. 10, free education for all children in public schools abolition of ch children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, et cetera, et cetera. When in the course of development, class distinctions have disappeared and all production has been concentrated in the hands of a vast association of the whole nation, the public power will lose its political power Character, political power properly so called is merely the organized power of one class for oppressing another. If the proletariat during its contest with the bourgeoisie is compelled by the force of circumstances to organize itself as a class, if by means of a revolution, it makes itself the ruling class and as such sweeps away by force, the conditions of production, then it will, along with these conditions, have swept away the conditions for the existence of class antagonisms and of class 
classes generally and will thereby have abolished its own supremacy as a class. In place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonism, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. That's kind of a, a classic statement there, but, but also the, the, the other things. You know, I'll, open it up for a discussion or applause. If I could start off something. <laughs> nice reading, Jim. Um, first off, I noticed that about three or four of these bullet points are are I think applicable to China. But one of the things I noticed is uh, in a section where you read, in the course of development, class distinctions have disappeared. Um, and oh, but, uh, public power will lose its political character. And I'm thinking that in terms of China, has that is that necessarily true? I mean, it seems to me you have different factions within the, within the Chinese Communist Party that disagree on on on, uh, uh, on on how to how to proceed and then they have different political powers I mean that was Xi Jinping I think was was in the middle of uh, of, 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 of eradicating or getting away from that um, thanks Richard this is Gary yeah I'd like to suggest that we um that we address these questions to what is going on in the United States. Good point. Yeah. The yeah. Chinese seem to be the Chinese seem to be having a very good time taking care of their own issues. I, right. I, I agree. I agree. I was I was looking at this in terms of a theoretical um, uh, position. I'm looking at it from the view, viewpoint of the fact that I'm not looking at it from a theoretical point of view. I'm looking at it from a yeah no point I, of view that we live in the United States and we're getting our asses kicked. Well, exactly. that's true. Yeah, I, I understand. Exactly. You. That's a point well taken, Gary. Okay, Norma, go ahead. Um, it says something about uh, uh, free education as a one of the stipulations about how we should uh, revise our living. Free education for all people. Uh, I think it I can't remember if it said for children or not, but in any event, I want to bring in the comment I read by uh, a 14 year old person who said, it's free compulsory education, which is a different kind of an experience. You know, I run for a uh, board of education every time that it's on the ballot. And people tell me, oh, you're opposed to education. Well, I could be a post-education, but that wouldn't make any difference. People would continue to learn because that's what life is. It's learning and thinking and uh, evaluating and so forth and having opinions. That's, that's what human beings do. So I can oppose education all I want to. What I'm opposed to is, of course, the compulsory education. You, know, you bring up private property. When I was 18, I went across the street to where my aunt and uncle were living from the house that we were living in. And uh, I was talking about something and he said, well, they want to come and take my property. If only I'd been able to say the line that came up in this presentation that we wanted to take the owner's <coughs> property and that the owners have already taken our property in one way or another, they've confiscated our access to it or eliminated us having access to it at all. But I didn't learn any of that in school. And, and in spite of the fact, as I've said, I'm third generation communist, my grandparents, my parents, and now me, and of course now my daughter and to a degree my son. Uh, if I had had the opportunity to have that discussion come up in school, it might have simplified huge amounts of trying to struggle and make sense of what the heck was going on, which I had a lot of trouble doing. 
And I still do to this day. I still do get revelations. Uh, the uh, idea of compulsory education is altogether different from people coming upon life and saying, we need to know this, I want to know this, uh, so forth and so on, and having uh, 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 self-directed in the sense of, we all want to know everything. <laughs> what, what, let, let's devise ways that we can be able to do that, uh, uh, urge people to pick up their lives themselves from a materially uh, sufficient life that they'd be living uh, in the uh, or, or even struggling for you know uh, the struggle for communism is elevating we're very excited to be able to do it it feels good I want to feel good with everybody oh well okay good. Rich had his hand up he was waiting I'm mute yourself Rich Johnson Rich, on the phone. Oh, okay. Rich Johnson, are you there? Your hand is up. Well. <laughs> go ahead, Rich W, go ahead instead. <laughs> it, it was up by accident. I guess, okay. Well, now we've read the 10 points. We know everything. Let's go on. <laughs> um, those are the Black Panther Party. Uh, I would like to, I don't know how to put my hand up on this thing, because on my phone, it, there isn't a real obvious way of doing it. So can I literally put my hand up or something like uh, that? If you bring it closer towards your nose, I will see it better. Okay, let's see. Put it closer to my nose. You mean my phone? You don't move, no, your hand. So all I saw was like the tip of your thumb. She could oh. just interject if yes, she could go just ahead. start talking. Go ahead. I don't have a photograph, Nina, so I just <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to say that, that I think uh, one of the things I find very difficult about our current and, and very um, real situation regarding education say in the Oakland schools, uh, is that kids do not learn, or young people do not learn a way of earning a living when they get out of high school. There used to be some of that when I went to high school. There seems to be a group for Berkeley, perhaps, uh, the academians, like all, or the Berkeley crazies, who want people to go on to college, which really is not necessary unless you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. Now, I was a vocational counselor for a very long time, and, uh, you know, we had to analyze uh, the, the labor uh, situation. And, and people really do need to learn a skill that they can earn a living with in the Bay Area when they get out of high school. And, and it seems like that is just like so, there's such an emphasis on, on going to college. You know, what, in what? You know, is it going to be saleable on the, in the labor market? You know, and I've analyzed the labor market a hundred million times over and over, you know, uh, what the current labor market is. And, you know, that's one thing I hold very strong views on. And then secondly, you're going to have to have probably have a second skill and then maybe a third, but at least start with the first so that people who have to earn a living, which is a good deal of us, uh, can earn a living right after high school. It used to be like in my high school, people learned auto repair and then they learned shop and carpentry. I took shop. I was one the first female to take shop, but, uh, and they put my picture in the newspaper, but anyway, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, it's just like people have got to uh, get real about earning a living. And, and I think they feel very ripped off after they get out of the Oakland schools, which there's a 40% dropout rate, by the way. And then they just get into groups that rob people. And that's, we have a very high rate of crime in Oakland. And, um, you know, because that's where you network, you learn your, you know, your, your business partners are robbers along with you. And so we, we have that. 
but that's not a really good way of earning a living because eventually you get put in jail. They have a record and on and on. And I used to have get jobs for people coming out of prison, you know, and it was difficult. So uh, I, I do think it's really important. Education is really important. The number one thing is earning a living. And this is like so simple that but people who, who are rather academic don't think of this. And, you know, there are things you can learn uh, that are not just trades. There's trades, of course, there's being an electrician, et cetera, and being a carpenter. But there's also, you know, just a uh, uh, medical uh, uh um, uh, how should I say, uh, coding, you know, where you have to know what the medical code means. And if sure, it's boring, <laughs> but it's a way of earning a living that isn't going to break your back because the United States has the highest rate of occupational injuries, physical injuries of any other Western industrial country still. I wrote a book about it. But anyway, uh, and also, you know, there are traditional strikes that are going on right now that evidently the left isn't so involved with publicizing, but there, there's a minor strike that just reminds me very much of which side are you on, you know? Uh, they say in Harlan County, uh, there are <laughs> no neutrals here. Well, you know, uh, it's just really a, a, a very classic uh, a, a strike, you know, and people are still getting black lung. And so, there's, you know, there are many occupations that people can have just coming out of high school, and they deserve to have a way of earning a living. I, I do believe that. And Jane, okay. jump three, in a little bit here. There's three people. Rich Johnson, if he unmutes himself. And then put me on the stack, please. Okay, shall do. Uh, so Norma and Richard W. and Jean are on the stack now. Go for okay, well, actually, this is Kit. Um, oh, hi, Kit. I, I'm on the stack. I'm on the stack here because of Rich's phone line. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to the comments about the importance of education in Cuba. Other socialist countries, education is highly prized. It's not a privilege. It's a right for everybody, um, regardless of uh, the class. But, yeah, in this country, we don't value it the same uh, same way where uh, your level of education is dependent upon your class. And I see that really well where I work because I, uh, my new responsibilities at work are now, uh, overseeing temporary employees who don't get the benefits, but, uh, they're, uh, student interns and college age students. Um, uh, it's rare in our group. If we have students that are really up to par and ready for the working environment in an office alone and in a government office, um, Many don't know how to read, they can't write, um, it, they can't add or do their timesheets. It's really a struggle dealing with, with these young people who aren't trained. Um, and some of them uh, just have uh, certain learning disabilities that need to be addressed. Um, and I think the addressing is happening much more now than it happened when we were young. Um, so there's recognition of kids with autism, what have you. But we have a long ways to go in this country um, in terms of getting the working class up to speed and educated. I mean, we talk about the rest of the country. I think in the Bay Area, we live in a bubble where people are generally highly educated. Um, the rest of the country, probably you're lucky if they're going to have a fourth grade reading level. Um, you know, these are the people that vote for Trump, you know, who who follow the right wing and tend to be very religious and anti-scientific, anti-intellectual, all these things that, uh, you know, we have to struggle with. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a long time, I think, before we do see any kind of revolutionary change in this country. Um, and I think for the masses to, uh, you know, we need to get the masses up to speed about who's, you know, interests are they really fighting for, you know? And I, th I think with the vote, that was a reflection that most people don't want somebody like Trump. They don't want fascism. I think they were shocked by the storming of the Capitol. And I think that's why people really don't want to have violence. But they also are, you know, I think people do recognize, not everybody, but a lot of young people recognize that the state will come down on uh, the violent 
people uh, who want to try to overthrow the government. But that also poses another problem for us because the right wing is being very, not right wing, I'm sorry, the government's being very uh, aggressive about going after the people that stormed the Capitol. Um, and so it'll be interesting how that all plays out. But the FBI is definitely on their tail and they said they're going after everybody, um, whatever they can do to go after those folks that tried to overthrow the, the White House. Oh, the Senate, I should say. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Kit. Norma and Richard W., can you wait until Richard Fallenbaum and Jean get a chance? To yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please. Richard Fallenbaum, you and Okay, Jean. yes, yes, that, that's me. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, remind people about the... Uh, uh, contributions. Um, I'm not able to put it up on the on the website, the instructions, but you can find it. How to contribute to the work of ICSS uh, uh, on the on your invitation, your email invitation. Um, and I urge people to do that. We still need money for the Marxist Library. Um, on on the general questions, um, you know, it's it's. You know, this class analysis is, is tricky. You know, we can go to, we, it is a general thing, but we look, we tend to look, um, but how we look at the details and how we use the details is important. For instance, um, in the United States, we tend, and, it, and it's true, it's true that also that among the, there's a lot of confusion, and it's true among the left. In particular, um, you know, for instance, the talk of left and right um, has has replaced uh, class analysis among the right. We talk about the ultra right, defeat of the ultra right, and so forth, and we don't um, we don't talk about the the class the class component of that, of that um, and how to maneuver among the class component. Um, uh, for instance, Trump represented a non-finance capital section of of capital, and um, why why is there a split between the the, um, the 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 finance capital and the non-finance capital and the uh, uh, and the petty bourgeois, which have previously been united, and how can the revolutionaries? Um, um, take advantage of that. Um, so um, we do need to study that. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the friend who suggested that we focus on uh, develop, developments in the United States is right on, because I think many of, the, many of our, um, our comrades, our communist comrades, have forgotten um they 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 adopt the liberal attitude you know um uh uh biden and harris and pre, pre, prior to that obama reflect, were representatives of big ca of big finance capital and many of us don't didn't recognize that at the time and we still don't recognize it and um so that's that's my comment thank you I'll take my hand down. Okay, Gene, you want to go? Yeah, yeah. Let me say some few things, and this will be my the final portion of my prepared uh, um, presentation. Which I really appreciate the fact that, that people jumped in and had. I think we had a very good discussion. But I just want to quote one part of the manifesto, which I think is particularly important. Um, right now and also, and then kind of rewrite that in contemporary terms. And this is, um, well, it's highlighted on, on your screen now. It's the communists turn their attention chiefly to Germany because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization and with a much more developed proletariat 
than that of England was in the 17th and France in the 18th century. And because the bourgeois revolution in Germany will be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. <clears throat> that was in 1848. Now, let me just write that, rewrite that or restate it the way they would no doubt write it in 1917. The communists turn their attention chiefly to Russia because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England in the 17th and France in the 18th century. And that's what we saw actually in February, 1917, um, when the, the women of Petrograd in the words of Alexandra Kolontai, uh, it was on International Women's Day in 1917 uh, that uh, the women of Petrograd raised the torch of proletarian revolution and set the world on fire. And that's what exactly what did happen. And as much as they have tried to put out that fire, they have not been able to set out the fire which continues to burn throughout the world. Uh, in Cuba, in, in, in Vietnam, and of course in China. So, um, and, and so th this is exactly what was uh, accurately not predicted, but what you could treat that as, if you treat that as a production, as a prediction, that was exactly what happened uh, in 1917. Um, and in 1917, as Alexandra Kolontai and Lennon pointed out, no country in the world has struck more deeply at the roots of, uh, of women's oppression, the oppression of all minorities and all oppressed people than the Soviet revolution did in 1917. Well, I think that, and that was also the prelude uh, in one sense uh, of a global revolution, which is continuing at the present time. So I think, uh, again, I just wanna say the manifesto is really speaking to us uh, directly right now. And it's amazing how these 10 or 12 European men were able to lay down a, such a perceptive uh, document that continues to guide uh, our species. So with that, I will stop, but people can, can continue. We have to end the, the um, uh, at some point, but uh, I'm not involved with that section. It's above my pay grade. So, but thank everybody for attending and we can continue the discussion, but I will just step back a few paces. Thank you ev everyone. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat, at our in-person forums. Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library at 65 
1901 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org.